This topic is soft power for countries, for governments, for nations. Let's build a country together. How can I build a country that everybody knows about and talks about? You want to start, Simon? Um, it's funny, actually, that you should ask that because I did start a country once. Really? Yeah. <laughs> what was it called? It was called The Good Country. <laughs> and I launched it in um, 2018. Um, because I've done a calculation and I've discovered that there were 760 million people around the world who would want to be citizens of it. Wow. Um, okay. How's that going? Um, it That's was a good. pilot project which we terminated <laughs> <laughs> um, because there was too much interest. We had too many people wanting to become citizens. We ran out of passports. <laughs> okay. It was virtual. We didn't have land. It was so you actually tried to start a country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wh what's the process? Um, I can't even remember it. It makes me exhausted just thinking about it. <laughs> Basically, you need to find a, a reason to exist. That's the first thing. Why would anybody want a new country? And this research showed us that about 14% of the world's population are what I call natural cosmopolitans. They're people who say, I'm a human being first, and I'm a French or Saudi or Guatemalan second. Okay? okay? And I just thought to myself, those people, they're not racist, they're not bigoted, they worry about climate change, they're not interested in domestic politics. They need a country of their own because their own country isn't serving them properly. So let's create a virtual country that they can be citizens of, alongside their existing. Got it. Okay, so David. Okay. Well, um, someone once said that if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. I think when it comes to oh, say that again, so we all understand it. If you if you build a better mousetrap, then the world will beat a path to your door, implying that if you just do something that's better, everyone will come and look for. Now, uh, if you think about nation branding, there have been quite a lot of nations that have built themselves in the last 50 years. For example, Singapore, which was nothing, but is now something. And the UAE is another example of a country that basically built itself and built itself very well. But I don't adhere to the fact that people will just come and find you. I think it is all about the quality of your communication. And one of the central things of this session, I think, is to say, what can you do to turbocharge the way in which people know about you? Yeah, because, because I think Simon says, so we're talking about media and marketing. How do I market my country? But then you say, yes, you have to market your country. You have to go out there and go on TikTok and, and magazines and TVs. And you're saying, just build the country and people will come. I have a huge problem with this. Please go ahead. <laughs> the world is not a supermarket and countries are not products. Right? Yeah, they are. No, they're not. Because they're not selling anything. I can't have the UAE even if I want to buy it. It's not for sale. Tourism, that's a different matter. And, and so all of this idea that you have to market your product to people is based on the idea that you're selling them something, but you're not selling them something. What countries are actually doing when they do so-called nation branding is propaganda. Propaganda is good. It doesn't have to be bad. Propaganda is pointless because nobody's paying any attention. Don't you get it? There are 205 countries on this planet nobody cares about. The majority of people care a little bit about their own country, not much, unless it's very contested. They occasionally think about the USA because it's kind of there. The other 203, they just couldn't care less whether they were there or not. And so the, 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 the UAE or any other country could spend 10 times its GDP sending out message, messages saying, we're wonderful, we're wonderful, we're wonderful. And nobody would pay any attention at all because they're not interested in your country. And wow. if you go on long enough telling everybody how fantastically lucky and successful and wonderful you are, they'll end up getting really pissed off because they'll say, why isn't my country that good? Okay, uh, you want to disagree or should I disagree? Obviously, I entirely disagree with that. 100%. Uh, the reason that I disagree is that countries all have objectives in what they try to achieve in the world, and it's usually for the betterment of their citizens, economically and in other ways. Uh, and, you know, they do run themselves in a way to prioritise the things they want, and they target audiences that they want, whether it be a business audience or a tourism audience or whatever. You therefore have to communicate with them. That is not the point. Uh, you can call it propaganda, you can call it information. I prefer to call it information. Okay, but, 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 but we're talking about two entirely different things here. What David is talking about is sectoral promotion. He's talking about foreign direct investment promotion, yes. trade promotion, cultural relations. He's talking about tourism. I don't have an issue with using marketing to sell those products. Why you would want to give it a fancy name, name like nation branding, I have no idea. But when you're selling something to people, of course you have to market it. 
But most of what goes by the name of nation branding is not selling things. You're not saying to people, buy this, it's good. You're saying, you will change your mind about my country, and everybody knows what that is. It's propaganda from a foreign state. Wait, 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 Simon, one second. Propaganda is not a bad word. Hollywood is propaganda, and every, Italian food is a form of propaganda for Italy. Did I say but it doesn't work? Works. What? Did I say it doesn't work? No, but you said it doesn't work. Propaganda actually works. Raise your hand if you watched a Hollywood production in the last year. Everybody has. Everybody it's loves Los Angeles because of Hollywood. That is propaganda that is effective. It makes us all want to immigrate to America. It's a product. It's entertainment. Of course it's effective. And there's propaganda within it. But nation branding campaigns are just pure propaganda. There's no content or relevance to the audience. I, I, I spent, I don't know, 10 years running a PR firm as part of the publicist group. And I remember more or less on the first day I went there, the guy that I was working with said, what we do is we accentuate the positive and we minimize the negative. That's Let's our job. Let's that. Accentuate the positive and minimize the negative. Yeah. And that, that's our job. What does accentuate mean? <laughs> uh, increase. Make bigger. <laughs> and minimize the negative. Your job is to actually talk about the things that are good. Now, clearly in the background, you have to be making them better. But you try and focus on the things that are good about your country, and then people will come to you. Now, the reason that nation branding is well, tourism, they yeah. come to you in various different ways, but uh, for example, you know, uh, you mentioned Italian food. Uh, Italian food adds a premium, and we work for the Italian trade agency, actually. They reckon that two-thirds of all food sold as Italian in the world has never been to Italy. Uh, it's come from somewhere else, but they get a premium for it. In England, we have various uh, electronics brands that they gave Japanese names to, so that they could yeah. sell more of them. And there are, there are many, many things like that. In, for example, the German car industry. That every country has the ability to put itself forward, and that is nation brand of life. Yeah? Simon? Can uh, you sing me again? Should we go home now? Because we're just not listening to each other. <laughs> well, okay, so what you're saying is, you're saying, when you have nothing to sell, yeah. like for example, you can promote tourism in a specific country. You can promote investments in real estate in Dubai, but you, you cannot. Cars or Italian cuisine. Okay, but you cannot sell Dubai as Dubai. You can't use the same tools that we use for selling products to change the image or to enhance the image of your country. I really don't agree with that. At all. But you know, there's, there's a term that says, but there's a term that says, fake it till you make it. So you but can't nobody's paying attention, nobody cares. Well, let me give you an example from the UK. Okay. Don't interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> That's British Thai humor. In, enhance the positives and, and, and whatever it was about the negative. So why would you care about the positives of um, Uruguay or Kiribati or the Central African Republic? Okay, the number one reason why someone would care is tourism. That's how everything starts as tourism. But the I second one starts as tourism. Tourism is simple. Tourism is an idiot business. The more money you spend on promotion, the more people will come to your country. It's not an issue. We're not discussing that. What we're discussing here is the attempt to change people's perceptions of your country, its governance, its systems, what it stands for, and nobody's interested in that because there are too many damn countries. Okay, first of all, there are not too many damn countries. There's only 195. 195. Well, it well, depends on what the country was not. Uh, so, so why I don't think we have 20,000 countries that we get lost in the thing. Second of all, you said it yourself. So many people want to change their country. Specifically, 760 million people you said want to change their country. I didn't say they want to change their country. They want. They don't have an affinity to their country. So that sounds like an opportunity to stand out because there's a lot of demand. That's another piece of sexual promotion. If you're searching for talent, okay, and you want to draw people to your country, yeah, absolutely. Communications are a good way of doing that. Do you see the distinction I'm making? Let, let, let me try and be a bit more constructive here because we, this is turning into a, a, a comedy thing. Um, I, I've researched the images of countries for, for, um, uh, for 25 years and um, I've collected an enormous amount of data about why people admire certain countries and why they don't. And what I've discovered, to my surprise, is that the primary driver of a good country image has got nothing whatsoever to do with how much self-promotion the country does. The main reason why people admire a certain country is because they believe it does good in the world. In other words, they feel glad that it exists, right? So the reason I like Guatemala is not because I know anything about their landscape or their people or the, the training shoes they sell. It's because I know that Guatemala cares about climate change. I care about climate change. When I go to bed at night, I say to myself, I'm glad that Guatemala exists because it makes the world a better place. Ergo, therefore, if a country wants to improve its image, there's only one thing that's going to work, 
and that's not wasting taxpayers' money on marketing campaigns. That is doing things, doing things that prove over a long period of time that you're good news, that you're a responsible member of the international community. It's like corporate social responsibility at the level of nation states, and it's the only thing that works. So it's true. <laughs> Let's not say I disagree. Let's say I would um, think of something new. Amend that. <laughs> In that obviously you have to do things which make you a more desirable and better country. Clearly. But that doesn't mean that everyone knows about it. Because not everyone is like you, Simon, studying the 200 countries in the world. <laughs> but that was exactly There are many before. You said, if you do that, let, let me speak, Simon. Simon, you said, let me speak. <laughs> so not everyone knows what your requires like, but might want to know. They don't know. Actually, many people don't actually even know about it. Most people don't actually know much about the UAE. In fact, they know very little about the UAE. And at least we've run out of time. One of the critical things that I've been thinking about the last couple of days, uh, and I was asked to answer the question of whether or not uh, countries should set up their own national broadcasters and use it for propaganda in quotes. Uh, the answer is yes, they definitely should, and most major countries do. And Britain was the first one to do so by setting up the BBC. The BBC is no more than a propaganda device for the UK as a country, and it always has been. It has always been controversial, and it always puts our point of view across. And after 100 years, it has persuaded people that we are the most, I think, generally speaking, that we are pretty good people, we've got a nice country called the Great Country. Um, you know, the BBC has been a massive thing of that. We do a valuation of media brands, and we put a value of four billion on the BBC brand itself. It generates five billion of revenue for the UK uh, country, and it also puts our message across in every single way. And the point that I want to make is, I am amazed that the UAE has not tried to replicate that. Because in every other field of activity, the UAE tries to be the best. Tourist building, the best ports, the best airline, even the best football clubs in, by, in the UK. I think, I think you should be creating a much more robust national uh, broadcasting function, which obviously goes on into digital. It's not just yeah. conventional media, it's all forms of media. It's films, it's news, it's documentaries, it's all sorts of things, and that will persuade people about many things to do with you. First of all, what you're doing, but also what a great country you are. Whereas at the moment, they don't really know. So, that is a great segue to the next topic of conversation. We can disagree whether you need marketing or not, but let's say we agree that we need to build our own version of the BBC. The question is, I don't agree with that. <laughs> well, you're going to have to agree because that's what we're going to talk about. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> So, so how, how does the BBC of the future look like? The BBC 100 years ago started with a radio, but if you start a radio now for the Emirates, ain't nobody gonna listen. So what does the BBC of the future look like? Simon, you can have an idea. Digital, digital, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Simon, do you like digital? I mean, do I like digital? Like, like, do I breathe oxygen? I mean, it's the world we live in. Okay, okay, so another question. Yes, please. I mean, I, I think the point about, if you look at BBC's history, Every new medium they have leapt into. So they leapt into radio, then they leapt into TV, they leapt into podcasts, they're very social media, although they control the way that it's done, much more, much less so than much more so than say you or other yeah. social influencers would. With you it's a lot more free. But they are still using the media. They will go on adopting all those media. So they are a media outlet to promote certain information. They reckon that their their purpose is to inform, educate, and entertain. And in doing so, they try and persuade everyone that we are wonderful people, and that English is the best language, and on and on. I see no reason why you guys should not do that for the UAE. But how do we do that? Because there's a lot of money going into media today, with new channels started every second day there's a new channel, but for some reason it's not getting as big as BBC. What is the problem? So like, one of the things that I've I found myself thinking over and over again watching the previous two panels when the discussion was basically quite similar. We're failing to distinguish between content and media, right? And people are constantly asking the question about the media, which is the right medium to be on. So is it television? Is it whatever? Yeah. I don't think that what really distinguishes those different channels is, is the channel that they use, it's the quality of the content. So will television survive? Yes, television will survive as producers of a specific kind of content 
for which there may always be a demand, long-form content, highly produced as some of the other panelists were saying. Its channel for reaching the audience, which is a box in the corner of the room, will not survive. That's almost certain. Radio, for example, survives. It wasn't killed by television, but because there's a kind of content there for which there is a fairly lasting demand. So I think we have to always be quite rigorous about separating what we're talking about. Content is king, as somebody once said. And so to try and answer the question, what would the UAE need to do if it wanted its own platform? Remember that the purpose of this, the way to get an audience, is to produce the content that people want, and the quality that, that amazes them, and not use the space to brag about how wonderful you think you are. So, yes, yes, it is about content, but if you can't control how the content is distributed, have no influence over where the content is created, you don't control the message. And I think you want to be controlling the message as far as you can and get as much exposure to the things you want as you can. So yes, uh, uh, no, uh, one thing is that in the old days you might have one little box in the corner for a radio. Now there are multifarious means of getting messages. You're in a hotel room, there's a screen there, that's not going to change. You're in a, a plane, there's a screen. You've got a phone, there are many, many, many ways. Uh, but it's going to be coming at you. And I think the UAE needs to leave it and invest heavily to become a major player in the media space. And you're in a unique position to do it, in my opinion. Um, you know, your, your GDP is about 500 billion. The BBC's turnover is 5 billion. That's 1% of your GDP. And our investment makes, it actually makes profit. So you not only do you get your message out, you also make profit. Yeah. Why wouldn't you do it? Well, yes, we will do it, but I think sometimes, so the message, we agree that the message has to be good. But I think what we disagree on is the packaging of the message. Because if you use the packaging that's correct, you get billions of exposure. If you use the wrong packaging, you get literally no exposure. For example, we all agree, let's say the UAE has a nuclear power plant. Great. 25% of the UAE's electricity will come from nuclear. Great. Now, that is a good content and a good message we all agree on. But how do we actually tell the world about it? Traditional media would go and make a TV show about it. Non-traditional media would make a tweet about it. Others would make a book about it. You have a book. Can you show me a book? You have a book. Now, you can distribute a message via a book, but who's going to read the book? <laughs> Not many people. So I think the packaging of the messaging is where we disagree on. You're making that up. We're not disagreeing on that at all. You haven't given me a chance to answer. <laughs> you just assumed I was going to disagree. I just assumed we disagree. No, I, of course I agree with that. Um, because as I said before, um, content is king. And the, I get countries reading that the whole time and basically saying, what can we say to make ourselves famous? And I always say, this is the wrong question. The right question is, what can I do to make myself relevant? If you're relevant, then people are much more likely to be interested in your content and to become hooked on it. We have a saying in English, and I believe the same saying exists in Arabic, you can lead a horse, horse to water, but you can't make it drink, right? And so there's an awful lot of content out there, my God, it's a lot of content. And just imagining that you can force people to pay attention and consume that content because you've got a whole load of money, well, it doesn't really work that way, as we know. It's got to be relevant to people's right. needs, their desires, their fears, their aspirations, their, their existence. Got it. Okay, we have three minutes left, and I am dying. I'm dying to change the topic just a little bit and get your opinions on the newest form of content, which is in the form of TikToks. What are both of your opinions on this platform that has one billion daily active consumers of media? It's cute. <laughs> and that's a problem, because you say it's cute, I say it's revolutionary. Okay. There's a big difference between the two. Just Why do you think it's cute? Why do you think it's revolutionary? Because you have one billion humans in the world. That fact is indeed remarkable. So why do you say it's cute? It's also cute. The reason why one billion humans watch it is because it's cute and people like cute stuff. David, you also think it's cute? I've never watched it. Exactly. <laughs> I think that I got upset when I was researching you. <laughs> I, 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 I thought I'm like, I'm not going to watch that. <laughs> but I know I'm not a 16 year old and I don't like dancing, so you know, like, why would I watch TikTok? Guys, I feel like, I swear to God, I feel like we're sitting on the Titanic and the iceberg is right there. <laughs> yeah, well, you've got two 
middle aged and old white men. So don't be surprised. But uh, no, the, the point about TikTok and all of the social media is that you have now got a very short but very powerful medium for getting messages across. Whether it's uh, something about perfume or a dance routine, or it could be a political message, it could be anything. Yes, it's a very powerful mechanism. There is no doubt. And in our table of the most valuable brands, the social media brands are all at the very top. They are the ones that are commanding people's eyeballs. Uh, I think the point is, though, that any sensible country has a mixture of things that they're, trying, that they're using to get their message across, from you know, one-hour documentaries on TV, to media in the print medium, to TikTok and other social media. So I, guess I did notice, actually, yesterday in the Times, they had a thing, there is now this category of people who are called de-influencers. You know that? <laughs> Apparently, they go around looking for people like you, who get paid to do an influential media post, yes. which they know is being funded by some a brand, yes. and so they go on and try and undermine the message, because they think it's unreasonable that a social influencer should be getting paid. So it's sort of guerrilla marketing against the paid-for influencers, which I think is an extremely interesting concept. Do you agree with it? Neither agree nor disagree. I mean, everyone's got their point of view. The, the whole point about this, and actually, this is where I, I do actually think the UA is in a, in a good position because they, there was one this morning uh, called Pieva from the IMF, and she was saying companies are successful um, where they've got education, infrastructure, and rule of law. And you know, the UA seems to me to be pretty well placed. Yeah, but Denmark has the same three things, and hey, nobody cares about Denmark. Yeah, but I Denmark, just Denmark, building the product. Denmark doesn't have, have the money that you. It doesn't have the ability to well, Denmark is a very powerful country on this. Go ahead, Norway. Norway has the money, but nobody's visiting Norway, talking about Norway left and right. Yeah, but the 185 countries don't want to go and live in Norway, but they do want to come and live here because it's a nicer place to live and there's more going on and there are low taxes. I mean, you've got the, the wherewithal to make this a real media centre, in my mind, a real media centre. Yes. Guys, we're running out of time. Any famous last words? Simon, make a last impression. Oh, come on. <laughs> this was the most frustrating conversation I've ever had. <laughs> Thank you. High five! High five! Simon is one of my greatest heroes. <laughs> was that going to end you? Oh, that's you. That's literally your statement. That's it. I think Simon and I would not <laughs> disagree more. Uh, Dave, that was my TikTok moment. <laughs> What's the famous last words? Uh, well, I urge the UAE to do what I've said. <laughs> spend far more money putting its message across. I mean, for example, before I came out here, don't be insulted, someone said to me, are you going to Dubai? Yes, I am. Oh, that's the capital of Abu Dhabi, isn't it? <laughs> and I said, no, it's not. And I tried to explain it. People just don't know enough. And on the plane out here, I watched a film called Fisherman's Friends, which is about some fishing, fishermen guys who become a group and sing in Cornwall. It is a very, very emotional, heartwarming thing that makes you really love Cornwall. <laughs> How many of those kind of messages are coming out about places like here? Do people really understand it with their hearts and their minds? No, you need to get that across, and I think you've got the wherewithal to be able to do that. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs>